Jake likes machine guns. I like machine guns. Welcome to our first episode. What should we talk about today? Um, I think we should go over the story of Mike Pappas because it seems to come up quite a bit. A lot of people want to know. Someone asked about that, huh? That was a request. Where should I start? Um, Let's let start me. with what you fear the most. Like, when, when were you the most scared in the Pappas story? Most scared that I've ever been? Yeah. Probably when I got married. <laughs> it's a good start. <laughs> no, that's if my wife listens. That's, that's really not true. Best day of my life. Without her, I'd be nothing. I can say that about mine, too. But this story, let's begin. My parents met at Olympus High School. Or should I fast forward a little bit from there, maybe? That might be a little early. Yeah, that's a little early. I don't want to bore people. Well, I would say I have always had kind of a affinity for firearms. And I got that a little early like a lot of people. I kind of got into a certain kind of, let's say, more modern firearm when traditionally at that time people were into more hunting guns or maybe Western-type rifles and things like that, shotguns or whatever. So I kind of like the uh, ARs and AKs and, you know, that sort of thing a little bit. So as time went on, I kind of went that way, and thankfully I was a little bit ahead of the curve on that. (laughs) So as those rifles, firearms that I was interested in became more commonplace and popular, I already had a fairly good understanding of them. So what were you doing before you got into the firearm industry? I made my living as a mechanic, and I, I did that for several years. I was driving home from Salt Lake here to Camas from my, you know, hard day of hard labor and fixing cars for people. Turning wrenches. And, yeah, as it were. Mm-hmm. Bending them, I think, is the, <laughs> what they say. But Look at those hands. I'm sure you've bent a few. Bending some wrenches. <laughs> a ad came on the radio for a gun store that I'd never heard of mm. called Get Some. So I was in no giant rush to go home, so I turned the car around and went to the address they gave on the radio and walked in there. Kind of got to know those guys a little bit. Super cool guys. I happened in there one day, and they had a uh, AR-15 in there, and it needed a float tube or, I don't know, buttstock or something, and they were trying to figure out how to change it. And I was like, I've got my range bag in the car. Would you like me to fix that for you? And they were like, really? I was like, sure. So I went and got my range bag, had some tools with me, fixed it for them. And then from then on, I used to stop by there on Friday evenings on my way home. And I'd trade, like, ammo and mags or whatever. To fix their guns? They'd stack up a few, you know, so I'd go in there and put a barrel on this one. And, you know, they had weird things, like they had a gas tube upside down or whatever. And I'm like, oh, well, we could turn this around and then that one would work. (laughs) You know, things like that. Huh. That kind of evolved into Stuart Wallen, the owner of Get Some, great guy, asked me if I would work in there every other Saturday. And I was like, that sounds actually kind of cool. So I did. And it was a riot. I loved that. I would work in there every other Saturday and, uh, you know, sell some guns, talk to some people. That kind of evolved a little bit. He started asking me if I would manage the store and work in there full time and that went on for a year so and one day I just decided to do it so then I managed get some I remember you what led to that though was when Mike Pappas became more of a a figure there the landscape of business skyrocketed as far as customers and meeting their needs and gun sales and you were just rank you know raking it all in huh well remember at the time that was just 
that time was near the end of the Clinton ban. So you still had your bare muzzle and non-collapsible butt stocks per se on AR-15s and, you know, yada, yada, all the compliant guns. So when that started to, I mean, we were kind of in that, and we'd do pre-bans and, you know, all the fun stuff. The store, as I recall, had a month where it did $40,000 in sales. And three months after I worked there full-time, we did one fifty. Oh my God. Per month, so the Pappas effect. It was actually pretty awesome, and then I'll, you know, we were known as like the go-to kind of, if I could say, military-style rifle outlet or whatever. We started slinging some machine guns and cans, and how much money of your paychecks or commission or however it was set up did you spend? Or let me put it this in a better way: from start of working there to finish. How many guns did you accumulate in your private stock? Oh, my. Or, or is that allowed to, are you allowed to say? Roughly? You know, I don't know. A, let, a considerable amount. <laughs> Enough to make certain people uncomfortable. Yeah. Let's say that. That's fair enough. Wow. So I, I made a deal for a percentage of the store profit starting because it had never really made that much money. So... I took that percentage of store profit and I took some guns out of there. I mean, I took some guns out of there. Yes. It was awesome. <laughs> I could just All see, I had this visual of Mike <laughs> just like after a week of work, just loaded, or like All a shopping cart just full of ARs. Well, I'd have like thousands of dollars of like store credit and I could just go in there and take whatever I wanted, basically. Good times. Yeah, that sounds like heaven. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. Then after the, you know, towards the end of the Clinton ban, the assault rifle ban, Stewart bought a larger building and put an indoor range in it. And then once the ban ended, oh, oh my, good times. Traffic. Yeah, that place rocked. Okay, so from there... You went into the suppressor world, correct? Okay. At the small store in the small store where I started, if four people came in and you could just watch them, naturally that was about the amount of people that could stay in the store. If five or six came in, they couldn't move around and they'd bump into each other and someone would leave. That's tiny then. It'd only hold like four people. But, man, we wrote some business out of there. Yeah, it sounds like it. Wow. So, during that time, Jonathan Schultz had come into the store. And we kind of got to know each other. And he asked me if I would order him an advanced armament black box. Which was, in essence, very similar to a Silencer Co. Osprey. Mm. I told him, you know, I hadn't seen one and... Advanced Armament had put a few things out and then didn't do them very long. And I was nervous that I couldn't get it, that I wouldn't get it. And I didn't want to deal with him after, you know, taking $1,000 of his money and then have him yelling at me like, where is it? So I told him, look, I'll, I'll order it. I have him on order. When it comes in, I'll call you. You'll be the first one I call. But that never happened. <laughs> so, <laughs> what you didn't call them, or they came in and you didn't call them, or they they didn't come in. They never brought it to market. Oh, so which was good for me is that I didn't have Schultz yelling at me, mm-hmm. wanting a refund, or you instead know, he was answers. like, "Well, screw it, we'll just make one." That's exactly what he said. Huh. He came in to the store one day and he said, "I want to start a silencer company." And I want you to do it with me. And I was like, huh. Well, I like silencers. I'll do it. And (laughs) machine guns. And machine guns. I like (laughs) machine guns. So (laughs) that's pretty much how Silencer Co. started. Hmm. So Schultz and Waldron, Josh, 
and Josh's brother, Cy, and myself were the first four people. We went and got the first loan and, and started. And you and had plenty of hosts to test them on. <laughs> let's say I was handy to half a round for <laughs> hosts, and I was also, at that time, very familiar with everyone else's product and, you know, already had a substantial amount of other cans from other manufacturers. So we decided to start with a rimfire can, the Sparrow. And Schultz, want, he was dead set on making a rim uh, monocore. So that kind of freaked me out a little bit. Not the fact that we were making a monocore, but the fact that it would be like everyone else's. Mm. We needed kind of a leg up, you know, something to differentiate us, if you will. And I thought about that for three days. And on the third day when I woke up. It sounds right like in we're there, reading out of the Bible right now. And on the third day, Mike Pappas woke up. In my bed right there in the house. I was like, I got it. We're going to take these two clamshells, half pipes, put them on the core, slide the core into the tube, and no matter how dirty it gets, it'll slide out, and then you can pop the shields off of it, the clamshells, the half pipes, whatever you want to call them. And so I was all excited, so I went to, I was still at Silencer Co. We'd started, or excuse me, get some. I sound like Mr. Biden. Anyway, (laughs) I called Schultz from work. And he's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And I remember getting kind of angry. And I was like, but I don't think you get what I'm saying. I don't think I'm conveying my idea to you very well when you're not understanding. I remember hanging up the phone, and I'm like, I'm going to come down there. Stay there. I'm on my way down. I went down, and he had, it was uh, Taco Tuesday. (laughs) This was probably a Wednesday. (laughs) He had these taco time napkins and a big pen. And I grabbed one of the napkins and the pen. I wish I had kept the napkin now. I didn't, though, because it was just a scratch pen drawing. And I drew it on there and showed it to him. And he was like, oh, my. That's what we're going to do. Great idea. So that's how the Silencer Coast Barrel came to be. Mm. Schultz and um, Todd McGee. Did the core Todd had done a Form One can that was had a very great core in it. In the Silencer Co can looked very similar to that. Did you have more hair back then when you were designing, coming up with these ideas? I was experiencing some hair loss at the time, <laughs> but I wasn't experiencing enough hair loss to call you know a place to get help. You want to know why I asked that? I decided not to worry about it, but yeah, later I decided to go with the shorter haircut to try to keep some dignity because I I looked like that guy that smashes the fruit. I was starting to get that look going. I know exactly who you're talking about. (laughs) With the big mallet? (laughs) I didn't want to look like that. Or smash fruit. A clown, yeah. I only asked that because I'm so, I'm sure the audience would agree. But listening to you tell that story, I have, like, the most vivid visual, and I want to match the Pappas of that time. So I'm, now I'm trying to visualize a little bit of darker hair, a little bit longer, the younger Pappas. How many years ago was that? That would have been 2007 or eight, right in there, probably seven, eight. I was just finishing college. Not that long ago. It really wasn't. In the grand scheme of things, as it were. So fast forward to you leaving. I didn't leave. I got fired. For bad morale. Let's talk about that a little bit. I think it's a very important point. Yeah. I believe really what happened there is we had great differences of opinion on how to run the business. In other words, you know, terms were thrown around like, using someone else's money and we went into some debt and I am maybe wildly debt averse. Let's, I think that's a fair way of putting it. 
I've never had a nice car, but yet I've never had a car payment. So everybody else was, I was a little, I don't know, we were kind of polar opposite. As time went on, I, I, we started to find less and less common ground on general direction of the company. And I think I was seen as a uh, opponent to everything everyone else wanted to do. So I was fired, which sucked. That does I suck. told my wife, I went home, it was, I want to say it was how, the Halloween, and we were going to do some trick-or-treating, you know. My girls were kind of small at that time. <laughs> and I told my wife, I, I said, I, th- I think I got fired today. She was like, how? How could you get fired from your own company like you're an owner? And I was like, I'm pretty sure it happened. Sorry. Wow. <laughs> Happy Halloween. Yeah, let's, uh, let's knock on some doors. Tell me you at least went back and grabbed a nice, you know, cold glass, threw a couple cubes in it, poured a little Jack Daniels and some Coke, had a couple sips. I didn't. Oh. Sorry, I probably... In retrospect, I probably should have done that. But, you know, it is what it is. And I then got a job at the gun vault, which was awesome. About probably two or three weeks, maybe a month, I'm not sure, before Christmas, Eric Rogers, my phone rings, and I had his contact in, and I'd kind of gotten to know him a little bit, and he did Plinker Tactical. They did Smith & Wesson 22 Long Rifle Mags, and they had kind of a cool AR-15 upper in 22 Long. He called me, and we started talking, and he said he wanted to manufacture a rimfire can. So I started thinking, and... I came up with this. You're like, I've done that before. Actually, it was a pretty awesome idea. Like, mm-hmm. it rode on, like, some rails, so it could come apart, but it wasn't monocore, so it didn't have the pop, and it would sound good on a pistol, I hoped. And as that evolved, that ended up eventually evolving into the mask, and that's why the mask has those ribs on it, so it doesn't get stuck in the tube on the joints of the baffle, right? I didn't know that. Interesting, huh? Yeah, I'm sure the audience didn't know that either. Probably Some not. Yeah, that's pretty cool. This is a action-packed podcast, Whoa. isn't it? <laughs> My palms are sweating. So the more that we spoke, then, you know, some weeks later or whatever, Eric called me and said, I want to, I'm going to sell my shares of Plinker, and I want to start a silencer company. And I was like, okay. So Eric found... Todd and Vin are investors, Mm -hmm. are money people, Mm -hmm. and BPI. He knew people at BPI, and BPI was wanting to start a silencer division, as it were, so it was perfect timing. So we were like, hey, we kind of know what to do, and it, it uh, it was pretty good timing. So I called Todd McGee. I was like, I gotta call Todd. Todd had also been ejected as it were from silence or co <laughs> wow <laughs> a little while shortly before i did but uh it's kind of it reminds me of like a famous band breaking up and then all of a sudden they get reunited yeah and kinda. under a different name yeah <laughs> <laughs> it kind of was like that so i called todd and i started speaking with him about it and i was like dude you have to do it like please and we went back and forth, and then he said he agreed to do it. So that's how we got Todd, our engineer. And then we started. We started normally, and I think this goes for 90-something percent. Everyone starts with a rim fire can because there's a great market. It's low cost. It's low cost to develop. It's low cost to manufacture. It's an easier cartridge to suppress. Mm -hmm. So we decided that we would start with 30 caliber rifle since we kind of already, you know, we were like, as it were, high school or maybe you could even say college graduates of (laughs) silencer manufacturing. I think that'd be fair enough. (laughs) 
I wouldn't go so far as to say doctorate, but maybe community college. <laughs> You're at the doctorate level now. Okay. Dr. So, Mike Pappas. <laughs> I like I like machine guns. So I decided <laughs> we decided and came out with the Sandman series right out of the gate. And the next product we did was then Rimfire and then Centerfire Handgun. And the answer is most likely Sandman is. <laughs> we talked a lot about mounts and I had a what I thought was a really great idea for a mount and Todd's like I have a better idea. I was like, okay, let's see it. He showed it to me and we started to make it and I was like, Yeah, you're right. Your mound idea is better than mine. <laughs> he liked that, didn't he? I'm sure he did. Yeah. It's sure true. Yeah. So that's how we got the chemo and then Todd and I started to get a bunch of different baffle designs made and spacers and testing and when we were happy with that back pressure and sound we got some welded up tested them and then we're like we're ready we're ready to make them let's do it yes it's awesome and then we launched at uh nasgw and then went to shot show that year and it was pretty amazing i was super thankful that we were very well received and that was, are we on year six now or year seven? That would have been 2014. Mm. <clears throat> and then from that point, we've continued from there to where we are. And then you and I met, had a great interaction. Not as now, cool of a story, but it was pretty awesome for me at least. It was awesome for me too. Yeah. Texas Range Day. Where were we? In somewhere outside of Fort Worth? It was in Texas. I know that. Mm -hmm. It was cold, actually. I don't recall it as being super warm or really uncomfortably cold, but yeah. it probably wasn't. I remember Jack Callahan, because I was a shooter there, and you guys had a booth and a number of other companies, and there were stations, and each shooter had a group. There was like four groups, four or five groups, and you had to follow your group. And there was time frames you could be at each station. And you're supposed to get content. And when I got to your station, I think yours was like the second station. I couldn't leave. And I remember he came over and was like, Rich, you're supposed to move with your group. <laughs> <laughs> and he actually got it. He got mad at me. He denies it, but he was mad at me. He was probably just a little nervous about his yeah. event and everything. I get it. What was the first thing that you said to me when we met? I saw Rich and he was walking, so I walked up to him and was like, I'm Mike Pappas, and from time to time my mouth can get me into a lot of trouble, and if that was to happen, I want you to help me. Yeah, that's right. Like You need to beat someone up if that needs to happen. Yeah. If I accidentally make someone angry with one of my fun little comments, Yeah, I thought it would be handy to have Rich come charging over there and be like, no, you can't beat this old guy up. And the rest is history. I was <laughs> like, I need to be around this guy all the time. <laughs> I thought you'd be super useful for that. Yeah, like I a was, bodyguard. I wasn't expecting anything to really come of it. I remember talking to you and Anson and just really jiving and then thinking like, hey, if there's anything that I can do and provide um, on the side, it'd be great to work with you guys more. And Well, and we needed a little... Uh, I think we had gotten to the point to where we needed to kind of uh, get an in-house guy. The timing was right. A guy that could do the socials. And the podcasts. And podcasts. And here we are. We're feeding the people. They asked for it. We're not doing this for our own, you know, fun, even though it is fun. Hopefully they haven't turned it off a long time ago. Let's go into... A couple of things that you hate and a couple of things that you love right now in like the current Mike Fat Pappas phase. I know one thing that you love is this piece of freedom here. You literally carry it around like my two year old carries around a blankie. It's like your security blanket. I'm just, you know, a little into it right now. I can't help it. I love it. I like to have it handy. 
you like machine guns. I do. <laughs> it's true. I like machine guns. <laughs> what else well, do you like? And then we'll do two things you hate. I'm a glasses half full guy. So things I like. I like uh, I like tools. I like chainsaws. Oh yeah. That was actually a request. Someone asked if we could just do an entire episode about chainsaws. Maybe maintenance, tuning, um, chain tension, do's and don'ts. All right. In the Helpful comments hints. in the comments thread, <laughs> if that's something you want, let us know. Otherwise, we're probably not going to go for an hour talking <laughs> about still chainsaws. No, we're probably not. No. So uh, I like military trucks and... I actually like a BMP a little bit. That thing moves. It's actually kind of fun. Mm -hmm. It's It's interesting. Yeah. It's amphibious, which I thought was really cool. I was like, how the heck is that machine going to float in water? I'm sure if you tried to pick up a luxury liner, you'd ask yourself the same question. (laughs) Maybe we do a vlog of us taking it. We'll We'll get it licensed, you know, so you can be a captain of a boat. We'll just take it to the lake. and They won't let me, but we'll have to find us a private pond. Okay. I'm sure that would be, people would be really into that. I tried to get the great state of Utah to let me get some of those little recreational decals, but they've, they denied me four times, and then I pretty much gave up. <laughs> they, wonder crushed, why. they crushed my soul. Yeah. Man. Okay, a couple things you hate. Okay. You know, I'm a... Definitely a glasses half full guy. So I try to find the good in everything. You know, like, say we're in a drought right now. <laughs> we are. Yeah. We're going into one. It's been the, but on the positive side, it's been the best winter I've ever had in my life. The only reason why I laugh, because people are probably listening and wondering why is he laughing, is because I know where Mike is going, because we've talked about <laughs> this, and I really want you to share. Why, why dr- droughts? But well, you, you love it and you hate it, right? Well, yeah, sure. I mean, I don't want to have hardship in my life, but yet the property values here are out of control. Yes, they are. I'm trying to find some land, and it's insane. In, it's crazy. If we had a good, solid drought, and that made some people move away and kind of lower the population, lower the demand, and lower the property values, that would be a positive yeah, I think it would be easier, you know, traffic, and I wouldn't have to fight for goods and services over at the grocery store, hardware store, whatever, with people. That'd be nice. I so. could just see in your mind there's, like, a line of people that are from out of state that are increasing the property value because you can pick them out pretty easily Yeah, with their Patagonia. Nothing wrong with that brand, but they just have a look. They look, well... I think they dress better than us because they're of a higher caliber than we are. Yes. They're cut from better cloth. Yes, exactly. They have more money. But I could just see in your mind, like, go into your head at the moment you're stuck behind a few of them making demands to the local people at the grocery store. And Mike's just thinking to himself, a good drought. They wouldn't, be doing, they wouldn't be doing that if they hadn't showered for six weeks and they were really thirsty. <laughs> this is true. A good drought would solve this. You'd just go away. They'd be somewhere where they had water. The way I figure it. I don't know. Well, another negative, a thing I don't like. Like, I like a military truck. I do. But I really don't like it when people put oversized tires on them. Like, bigger than the already oversized tires on a military truck? Correct. I may have never shared that with you, but it's just the way I feel. I like that, though. Plus, I'm not a fan of taking a truck with three axles and taking one of the axles off. Hmm. I'm like, what kind of an animal takes 33% of their braking ability and throws it in a dumpster? I don't get that. Is it like a looks thing? Yeah, well, it's more maneuverable, and it turns better, Uh, and it's, you know, cool. Makes it easier for the driver. To bob a truck. Gotcha. I don't like a bob truck, and I don't like a truck with tires that look too big. Hmm. I didn't know that. Well, there you have it. Well, that I think this was a pretty good first episode. <laughs> what do you think? I don't know. It felt like a lot of useless information to me, but... No. 
We'll, we'll see. I think your story is a story that needs to be told. I would like it to be a little driven by people listening. Yeah. You say what you want us to cover, and we'll talk about that. Or we're just going to get on here, fire up the mics, and talk about whatever we want. We'll just inside Mike Pappas. What's he up to? What's he thinking today? I'm good either way. I'm here all week, so... <laughs> Our mission with this podcast is to try to get one episode to you guys every week. And we're thinking Monday mornings, we'll post it up, get your week started off right with a little bit of ASMR with Mike Pappas. Like I could listen to it on my way into the office. Good. I might. I will. Okay. All right. (laughs) Thanks for tuning in, guys. That's it. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like, subscribe share with all your home slicers.